Hey, what's up guys? It's Pastor RJ here, and I want to encourage you to join me right now in Ephesians chapter 4 as we go through the top 10 challenges that teenagers face. Yes, I've talked about the 10 challenges teenagers face from Ephesians 4. And in my last video, I talked about the first five, and in this video, I'm talking about the last five. And so let's review the first five and then jump into the last five and break them down. So in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is trying to show us that we are called to leadership. That chapter one, it's all about God's plan. Chapter two, it's all about God's grace. Chapter three, it's all about God's church. But in chapter four, it's all about God's leadership. That he has called you to a specific calling. That God wants you to walk worthy as his ambassador. You are to represent him, resemble him, reflect him. You are his workmanship. And so he shows us how to actually be his workmanship. He says that he actually calls all of these people to be church leaders. He's given gifts to men and women, and he wants you as a teenager to know that you can be used by him right now. Remember, it's not about your ability, it's about your availability, and that God works through you and uses the gifts he's given you to accomplish much, to help people grow in their faith, to equip others for the work of ministry. So in chapter 4, he also tells us that we're now supposed to be renewed in the image of Christ, in the likeness of God. Our life should look completely different than the world. That our old life should be put away and our new life should be put on. we got to put off the old humanity and put on the new humanity that is through Jesus Christ. And so this is where these challenges come from. And so let's look at the first five challenges as a review and jump into the last five challenges and break them down. The first one was the challenge of ignorance. Actually saying, you don't need God. Actually saying, I don't need God, but through your works, it's one way of saying that you're smarter than God and that you're just doing whatever you want. And so ignorance is lacking knowledge and experience and wisdom. And so Paul says, don't walk as the Gentiles walked, as the world walks, who doesn't have God in their life. Don't think that you don't need God and you don't need other people in your life and you don't need these certain things. But instead, you need God. You need wisdom. And when you're young, you lack wisdom because you lack experience and knowledge. And so he says, don't give in the foolishness. That's what ignorance is, is giving in the foolishness. It's funny because in Psalm chapter 14 and 53, it says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And Paul says, by the way you live your life, we can see that you don't believe in God. So don't be like the godless world. Don't be like the culture. Be like Christ, and you need Jesus, and you need God, and you need to walk in a way that acknowledges Him instead of being ignorant. Such a challenge to all of us as teenagers, right? Because when we're young, we think we know everything, but then when you get older, you find out you don't really know everything, and that there is so much that you needed to learn. The second challenge was the challenge of sexuality, and Paul goes right to the main point here and says, we're created as sexual beings and we need to change. We can't just give into our flesh, give into the lust of our flesh, give into the temptations around us, give into immorality and impurity. Sexuality is holy and it was meant for marriage. It is a blessing that God has given us. It is a gift that God has blessed us with in so many ways because it was intended for us to be used as one of the blessings to procreate and have family. One of the blessings to have intimacy with somebody. And so God created it for marriage between one man and one woman. But in the godless world of Ephesians, there was a godlessness that was going on when it came to sexuality, where there was temples that you went to that was the sex gods. And there was all kinds of prostitutes that were all around. And, and in our day and age, although we don't go to temples, we go to laptops and we see pornography everywhere. So Paul's just like, get that out of your life. Don't put that trash into your life. Don't give in to sexuality. Don't give in to all these things and awaken love too soon. Don't awaken the beast. And so don't give in to your flesh and give in to these sexual things because they will hurt your relationship with other people and with God because that is one of the most intimate things that we can be a part of in our lives. And God wants us to have that between the context of marriage. And so the third challenge was the challenge of change. And he says, Jesus is the truth. And because he's the truth, truth demands change. And you need to live according to the truth. And so you need to renew your mind. You need to renew your righteousness, your works, what you do with your hands and your feet, the words that you say out of your mouth. And you need to also transform your holiness, your heart. You need to have a heart after God's heart. Your heart needs to be filled with holy things, not unholy things. 
So when you look at the Word of God and you see the big picture, God wants you to be like Him. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to follow Him. And so we need to renew ourselves. And that's one of the blessings of the gospel, is that the gospel gives us moral renewal and redemption. Something that was lost can now be found. Something that was broken can now be healed. And so He wants to renew you in His image. And so you have to change. The fourth change um, and challenge is the challenge of integrity. That you need to tell the truth. And so Paul says, you need to tell the truth. Don't put falsehood first. Get rid of falsehood. Don't tell lies. Don't gossip. Don't slander people. And then the fifth challenge was the challenge of anger. And isn't it true that so many people lie and they're angry in our day and age? We see it all the time at school where people always are lying about themselves because they don't want to get exposed or they just don't have security, right? They have insecurity. They just aren't sure about themselves and they want to look cooler than they really are or they want to get accepted and liked by others. But then anger comes out because they didn't get their way. Anger comes out because they got frustrated because somebody disagreed with them or something didn't work out or plans fell apart. And so there's so much anger that's out there and there's so much violence that's out there. There's so much racism that's out there. There's all kinds of inequality that's out there. People are angry. We live in an angry world because people see the brokenness all around and there's no cure outside of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, be angry and do not sin. It's okay to have a righteous anger and to be angry about the right things, but it's not good to have an unrighteous anger and take it out on others and to be a bad witness. You never wanna be a bad witness. So if your anger makes other people angrier, then that is a problem. So those were the first five challenges that the Apostle Paul gave us in Ephesians chapter four. Here's the last five challenges the Apostle Paul gives us in chapter four. And it starts in verse 26 and 27 after the anger passage. He says, do not be angry, right, and sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give opportunity to the devil. And he sets it up like this. Challenge number five, the challenge of laziness. See, don't give anyone the opportunity to be lazy. Don't give yourself the opportunity to be lazy. Be a doer of the word. Be God's workmanship. See, God has a lot of opportunities in front of you. But if you give the devil opportunities, and then to be angry and all these other things, then it's going to lead to laziness. And so Paul actually talks about theft and stealing things from others because you don't work for it, because you don't earn it, because you don't deserve it. Now we're not talking about working and earning for your salvation. We're talking about doing things for God with your life. Instead of sitting around and doing nothing, there has to be a preacher. There has to be a, 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 someone who's going to serve. There has to be someone who's an encourager. There has to be somebody that's a laborer. And so Apostle Paul says in verse 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor in doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So the point here is said, stop stealing. Stop being lazy. Stop taking everything for yourself. Stop being selfish. And this is a challenge to a generation where many of us have a lot of people doing things for us, so we don't have to do it. And we have to change our ways and say, you know, what? I need to be God's workmanship. And as a leader, leaders aren't lazy. Leaders take the initiative. Leaders get things done. So the Apostle Paul wants you to do these things. And he wants to challenge you to not be a thief. Because when you're lazy, you stop working for things and you just keep taking. And it keeps you from being a giver. If you're only a taker, you will never be a giver. And so laziness in our hospitality, laziness, in our generosity becomes a big problem and it doesn't show the heart of God. That's why Paul says, don't steal anymore. Don't take anymore. Stop being lazy. Work hard. Labor for God. Do things for Him and you will be great. You will do great things. You will be greatly honored. And so what a challenge for us as teenagers, right? Because so many people are lazy. Just like in a class project, Usually that one student does all the work and everyone else is lazy and doesn't do it. Or there's that one player on the team who doesn't hustle and then the whole team has to run. Or someone doesn't practice for their band performance and then the whole song is off because they were lazy. See, laziness leads to all kinds of problems. 
And the Apostle Paul says, Christians should not be known as lazy people. They should be known as servants who build the kingdom, who are his workmanship. Then the next challenge, challenge number seven, is the challenge of profanity. The challenge of profanity. Man, I don't know about you, but I hear more F-bombs. I hear more curse words when I'm at the mall and when I'm at schools and when I'm at movie theaters than anywhere else. I hear cursing everywhere. And in verse 29, the Apostle says, you need to stop cursing. You need to stop having corrupt things come out of your mouth. It says in verse 29, let no corruption come out of your mouth. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only as such is good for building up as fits the occasion as it may give grace to those who hear. So basically, we're supposed to be encouraging people with our words instead of cussing people out with our words. Man, it's sometimes a cuss word slips out because we hurt ourselves. We stub our toe or we drop something, right? Or we get into an accident or somebody does something and you're just like, what the, you know, and you want to, you know, square up with them. I mean, things like that happen. But we have to be careful to watch our tongue. Bible tells us in James chapter 3 that our tongue could be like a forest fire. It could start a little fire and it could just take over an entire forest. We have to be careful what we say. And as Christians, our words matter more than ever because we're supposed to be speaking the words of God. We're supposed to be speaking the words of Christ. And so make sure you look at your language, that you watch your language, and make sure that you are building people up with your words. What a challenge, because many of us struggle with our language. We don't cuss at church, but we cuss in the classroom. We don't cuss out at, the sh out, um, out at home, you know, on the streets and in the public maybe, when we're around family members, because we know we're gonna get in trouble. But we do when we're with our friends, and that is wrong. We shouldn't be saying things differently in one place and another place, but we should be people that always are speaking good things, wholesome things, godly things. So don't let corrupt talk come out of your mouth, the Apostle Paul says, the challenge of profanity. Number eight, the challenge of disappointment. And here's the thing I've learned. I'm 34 years old and I have experienced massive disappointment in my life. I experienced it when I was a kid. I experienced it when I was a teenager. I experienced it when I was a young adult in college. And I've experienced it now as a father and as a husband. Disappointment is all around. People will disappoint you because we're sinners. And the world will disappoint you because it is selfish. It is not for you. People want to say they're for you, and some people actually are, but in the end, everyone has an agenda. In the end, everyone has something that they're living for. In the end, everyone has something that they want to do and accomplish that may not line up with what you want to do and accomplish. And so you have to be prepared for the challenge of disappointment. And one of the most biggest disappointments you can have in life is when you grieve the Holy Spirit. In verse 30, the Apostle Paul says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed by the day of redemption. See, God's going to tell you, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you, God is going to help you um, do things for Him, and then when He tells you to do it, and you don't do it, it grieves the Holy Spirit. When you give in to sin, and when you actively disobey God, there's conviction, and that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. God's just like, ah, oh, you guys, you're not seeing it. Like you could have reached that person, but you decided to give into your sin. You decided to disobey. You decided not to listen. But guess what? I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to give you another opportunity. But man, this grieves me because I can see the bigger picture and I'm trying to show you the bigger picture, but you're only looking at yourself. So when you grieve the Holy Spirit, it's because you have an inward look you're only looking at yourself and your own interests. You don't want to be labeled and you don't want to be called names and you don't want to be outcast. You want to be accepted or you want people to like you or you want people to be for you. And so we end up grieving the Holy Spirit by, by, not, by not doing what God's actually called us to do. And so disappointment happens in our lives and we don't want to have disappointment like that because you're going to have failure in your life and what you have to do is get right back up. But when you have failure on the level that Apostle Paul is talking about here, grieving the Holy Spirit, you're going to have multiple consequences for your sin. Because it tells us in the book of Deuteronomy that your sin will find you out. And you will have to deal with the consequences for your sin in this life. Because there is always going to be something that you're going to reap and sow, according to Galatians 6. So don't make the decision to grieve the Holy Spirit. 
You don't want to be burdened with disappointment and guilt and shame because the gospel came to take all of that away. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to take that away. So when we do fail, when we do mess up, because it's going to happen, that you are there for us and we can get right back up and know that failure is the greatest teacher and we can move forward. So may this challenge be strong for all of you teenagers because you need to make sure you don't grieve the Holy Spirit and say no to God's plans, to what God is telling you to do. Instead, say yes and watch Him work wonders in your life. Number nine, the challenge of outrage. See, we live in a world of outrage, a culture of outrage. Everyone is protesting everything. It's crazy to think about that, right? And so the Apostle Paul actually lived through a protest according to Acts 19 in Ephesus. And so he knows what this is all about. It's talking about clamoring. It's talking about screaming and crying out and yelling without a context. Like it's not going to get you anywhere. It's not about expressing your civil rights. This is talking about getting permission to act crazy and to riot and to destroy and to hurt people and to do things that are wrong. And he says in verse 31 these things, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. See, these things don't love your neighbor as yourself. These things destroy your neighbor. They don't love your neighbor. They destroy your neighbor. And we can't have these things in our lives. We got to put away bitterness. We got to put away, put away wrath. We got to put away anger. We got to put away clamor. We got to put away slander. We got to put away malice. We can't have evil intentions. And then the last challenge is the challenge of forgiveness. The Apostle Paul ends this with a great gospel-centered exhortation. And he says in verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And in the end, forgiveness leads to so much fruit in our life. See, if you can actually forgive somebody, you can move forward. But if you don't forgive somebody, you will actually be held back. You will have envy and jealousy and all kinds of covetousness. You're going to covet people's lives, compare your life to them, and you're going to be constantly hating on them. And God says that is not a part of this new life in Christ. And right now we see a lot of teenagers dealing with this, where they're not willing to forgive, they're not willing to show grace, not willing to show mercy, they're not willing to show love. Only times they do this is when it's in their best intentions, when they get caught. Oh, will you please forgive me? I just got busted. Have you ever been there before when you got in trouble and you're like, oh, please forgive me. But then someone does something to you and you're just like, man, I will never forget what you did to me. You know, I'm going to forgive you with my mouth, but not in my heart. And so your words don't mean anything. So you can never preach the gospel because you can't go around telling people about the forgiveness of Jesus when you won't even forgive your friend or forgive your parent. See, God wants us to practice forgiveness every day and constantly be loving people. And that's the key to being Christ-centered is being forgiving, being someone who's willing to let go and God will help you move forward. So all of these challenges are about leadership. And so if you're able to take these challenges to heart and say no to ignorance and say no to sexual morality and say no to um, staying in your own ways instead of accepting change, the saying yes to integrity and, and telling the truth, saying yes to being godly and, and not giving in to anger and being somebody who's going to trust God and show God's love to others instead of anger and debate and fighting and violence. And to say no to laziness and to say no to profanity and to say no to all of the failures and disappointments of greeting the Holy Spirit, saying yes to God and His plan and His purposes and what He's speaking to you and calling you to do and to say no to outrage and to go crazy and to be unreasonable because you can never reason with crazy. And so people will just be like, man, I, I can't be around this person. They're insane. Christians should never be known as that. The media might want to point people to the church and say, hey, this is where crazy people are. And the media might try to paint people in the church that those people are crazy, but we know it's not true. There's always crazy people in the world, but true Christ followers are peaceful, honorable, dignified, quiet, and gentle people. And those are the people we're supposed to be 
who are filled with kindness and compassion, not outrage. And lastly, the challenge of forgiveness, that we would actually live out the gospel and show people forgiveness left and right 24 seven. So I pray that these top 10 challenges were a great exhortation to you, an encouragement to you, to help you as a teenager to follow God, to trust God, and that it would lead you from death to life. God bless you guys.